Good morning. My name is Matt Acton. I am the director of the middle school ministry here at Central, and uh, it's my privilege to be able to share with you all for a little bit. As you've seen and heard, we're in the middle of a sermon series called Overwhelmed, in which we explore some of those hard feelings we all wrestle with, feelings like failure, doubt, loneliness, feelings that I'm sure are certainly being felt heavily this week in Parkland, Florida. This morning, um, I'd like to create a little more time and space um, for us to be quiet and still before God. I have this contemplative bent to how I live out my faith, and uh, moments of quiet reflection are critical for me to how I connect with God and my relationship with him. Um, for some of us, this is going to be a little bit new, maybe a little awkward, um, a little uncomfortable, but I think that's okay because I believe that God does some good stuff when we're feeling uncomfortable and maybe even a little bit awkward. So if we could all, bear with me, if we could all begin with uh, closing our eyes. Um, I think if we close our eyes, it'll help us to be more, pre more present in this space as we remove some of the physical distractions. Um, also, it'll make it a lot less awkward if you all aren't, aren't staring at me. Um, thank you. So now with our eyes closed, settle yourself into this space. Pay attention to your breathing. You don't need to take long, deep breaths. Just be aware of when you breathe in and when you breathe out. Imagine a photo album that you can flip through full of pictures that tell the story of you. Or imagine a Netflix queue where you can binge watch episodes of your life. Now ask the Holy Spirit to bring a specific moment to the forefront. Go back to a time in your life when you remember feeling most connected. Maybe it was a time when you felt most connected to the people in your life. Maybe it was a time when you felt most connected to God. Whatever the moment is for you, go back and spend some time in that place. Take time to reflect on the emotions that are present. What are you feeling when you go there? Now go back to your cue or your photo album and flip to a moment when you felt most disconnected, either to God or to the people around you. Spend some time now back in that moment.
What did it feel like then? What does it feel like to go back there now? Father God, thank you for your presence in all the moments of our life, or those moments when we were connected to you, connected to the people around us, connected to our community. Thank you for what we take away from that, the strength and encouragement. For those moments when we felt far or disconnected, Lord, thank you for still being close, whether we felt you or not. Lord, please be present in this space this morning. Amen. For me, two moments come to mind when I think about periods of loneliness and isolation and disconnection. The first was when I was a summer camp counselor. Um, this is one session where during the same period of time, I happened to get both lice and a terrible cold at the same time. Nobody that I worked with wanted to be around me. Uh, they kept their distance. I was very isolated for the rest of that session. Um, in fact, I think there's a few of you here who don't want to be around me just because I said the L word. Uh, you can all relax. It was like 20 years ago. I'm totally fine. <laughs> the other moment was when I was in high school. During my sophomore year, uh, poor study habits and bad choices had caused my grades to plummet. Um, and in a desperate attempt to remedy this, I ended up transferring to a private school. The thought being that smaller class size, more teacher oversight, and a focus on college preparation um, would turn things around. And academically, it did. Um, my grades rebounded. I got decent SAT scores. Um, I got into the school of my choice. But socially and relationally, um, the move to a new school felt like a blow. I was starting my junior year with a new group of peers who had been in the same school together, the same classes together since eighth grade. Relationships had been set. Friendships and social clusters had been cemented over the past three years. Um, it wouldn't be easy for anyone to break into that community, let alone somebody with little confidence and super low self-esteem. I remember dreading those moments when a teacher would ask us to get into groups or to find a partner to do some classwork with. I remember wrestling with trying to find a seat in the cafeteria or just going up to the library to hide during lunch. I remember feeling incredibly lonely for eight hours a day, nine months a year, for two years out of my high school time. Now, while my situation may have been unique to me, my adolescent experience of loneliness and isolation is not. I'm sure most students here can recall moments when they have wrestled with feelings of loneliness moments when you felt left out or excluded, moments when you felt that parents, teachers, coaches didn't really understand you or what you were going through, moments when you felt abandoned by friends. Maybe for some of you, this isn't a past struggle, but something that's still going on right now. In his book, Hurt, Inside the World of Today's Teenagers, Chap Clark writes about some of his conversations with youth. He says, when feeling safe enough to admit it, every student I talk to acknowledge that loneliness is a central experience. If you would like to know more about Chap Clark's wisdom and thoughts and insights about teenagers, he's actually going to be here um, on March 3rd. He is the main speaker for our Strangest Thing event. Um, if you are a parent, teacher, youth worker, or anyone else who cares about the teenagers in your sphere of influence, you should do whatever you can to get here on that day. Now, loneliness isn't just an adolescent condition, as we're all unfortunately aware. College students leave home to start a four-year adventure that is equally exciting and terrifying. Loneliness is often a part of that first year away from home. 
When you become a parent, your days seem to be filled with equal measure of joy, exhaustion, and isolation. I remember leaving the hospital with our firstborn thinking, wait, they're just going to let us walk out of here with this baby? No one's going to come with us to make sure we don't screw this up. We're on our own. I can't tell you how relieved I was to hear another parent of younger kids confess that they were struggling with the role. It's like, wait, you think you're screwing up your kids? I'm screwing up my kids. We should totally be best friends. (laughs) And with parenting, just when you think you've got it all figured out, puberty hits and you have to start all over again. Parents of teens or preteens, if you're feeling overwhelmed, confused, and lonely, you should definitely come to the strangest thing of any. Then the kids grow up and move out, people retire, which sounds pretty good from my perspective, but if you don't intentionally seek out relationships and community, this life stage can be marked by extreme loneliness. And it's not just these life stages that people experience loneliness. There are pockets of people in our world who find themselves marginalized because of their race, because of their gender, because of their lifestyle. Nobody should be made to feel alone. But we all feel it. For some, it's just a passing phase, but for others, it's a chronic condition they just can't seem to escape from. In the UK, a recent report finds that nine million in the country often or always feel alone. I imagine the numbers here are equally staggering. Studies have linked loneliness and social isolation to heart disease, cancer, depression, diabetes, and suicide. In the words of our creator, it is not good for man to be alone. And as we turn to scripture, it's not hard to find loneliness in the Bible. We could join Joseph as a slave and prisoner in Egypt, Ruth as a widowed stranger in a foreign land, or the Apostle Paul sitting in prison. But this morning, as we have over the past few weeks, we're going to look to the Psalms. And if you want to follow along with me, I invite and encourage you to do so. We are going to be looking at Psalm 88, which starts on page 542 of the Bibles in front of you. Um, Let me pray again as we enter into God's word. Lord, thank you so much for this time and space that we have to come together, to worship together, to pray together, to draw closer to you together. Please use the scriptures and these words to bring us closer to you. Amen. Psalm 88. You are the God who saves me. Day and night I cry out to you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. I am overwhelmed with troubles and my life draws near to death. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like one without strength. I am set apart from the dead. Like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, who are cut off from your care. You have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavily on me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. You have taken me from my closest friends and have made me repulsive to them. I am confined and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. I called you, Lord, every day. I spread out my hands to you. Do you show your wonders to the dead? Do their spirits rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave, your faithfulness in destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? But I cry to you for help, Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? From my youth, I have suffered and been close to death. I have borne your terrors and am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long, they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken from me friend and neighbor. Darkness is my closest friend. First of all, I think we can all agree that this psalm is super cheerful and uplifting. It's pretty clear why theologian N.T. Wright calls this the darkest poem in the book. There are over 60 psalms of lament um, in the book of Psalms, and many of these psalms end with some hope, some reminder that, of who God is and how he's always there for us. Psalm 88 ends with a Simon and Garfunkel lyric, Hello darkness, my old friend. If we're looking for any sign of hope in this psalm, we can catch a a slight glimpse at the beginning. Lord, you are the God who saves me. Despite all the pain and despair and loneliness plaguing the psalmist here, there's still recognition that God is the one who saves him. Not saved, but saves, as in continues to rescue. 
If there's even the slightest chance this author will find peace, it will be by God's hands. And so he prays, not just once, but over and over again. Day and night I cry out to you. This is a prayer of desperation. Not one whispered quietly to oneself, but a prayer that one cries out at the top of their lungs with arms stretched out. Day and night I cry out to you. In verses 3 to 5, the psalmist describes his current condition using words and phrases like overwhelmed, near death, without strength, feeling cut off from God and forgotten by him. How do these words compare to the words that you put to your moments of disconnection and loneliness? In those moments, it's understandable that we would feel overwhelmed or that we would struggle to find the energy and strength to get through it. And maybe there are moments when God feels far from us, that God doesn't care about our problems or that God doesn't even think about us. These are lies that we tell ourselves in the moments when we feel alone. Nobody cares about me, not even God. In the next few verses, we uncover who the psalmist holds responsible for his current condition. Instead of asking God's help, He starts to point his fingers and blames God for his loneliness. You have put me in the lowest pit. Your wrath lies heavily on me. You have overwhelmed me. You have taken from me my closest friends. For me, this is the hardest part of the psalm. Is God to blame? Is God responsible for this man's loneliness? Is God responsible for my loneliness? If we're going to examine some of the causes of loneliness, we can certainly point to many external factors. We can feel alone and isolated because of our disconnected culture. Social media and technology don't help. And sometimes other people are often thoughtless, careless, and just as broken as we are. And speaking of our own brokenness, sometimes our loneliness is caused by our own actions. We put up walls to protect ourselves out of fear of getting hurt. And these walls, they keep the bad out, but they can also keep out the good, and we end up being isolated. To my fellow introverts, sometimes we need to be alone. Sometimes we want solitude, and that's okay. That's how God has wired us, but he's also created us for community. And sometimes we need to step out of our comfort zones to be a part of it. And to all you extroverts, Just because someone sometimes wants to be alone, it doesn't mean they want to be lonely. A hard truth is that sometimes God may be the cause of our loneliness. Sometimes he is responsible, but I believe it is never out of spite or cruelty. Moments of loneliness and isolation can also be moments of preparation. Before he led God's people through the desert, Moses first spent time there himself. Before he started his public ministry, Jesus spent 40 days of isolation in the wilderness. It is in these times that despite his apparent absence, God might actually be there making us stronger. God is making us into people who recognize that our own strength will fail us, and ultimately we need to learn to depend on his. Maybe through our loneliness, God is making us more compassionate and more understanding of others. Mother Teresa, who dedicated her life to seeking God's will and caring for those with the greatest need, was not immune to some of the thoughts and feelings of Psalm 88. The book, Come Be My Light, is a collection and commentary on some of her private writings and reveals some of her innermost thoughts and struggles. It it says, Mother Teresa noted a new element to her experience, deep loneliness. This loneliness, her traveling companion from this point forward, resulted from her apparent separation from God and those she trusted most. In one of her letters, she writes, there's such a deep loneliness in my heart that I cannot express it. How long, O Lord, will you stay away? Even one of our modern day saints struggled with isolation from God and from others. But she was able to find purpose and calling out of it. In the book it says, henceforth, Mother Teresa began to love the darkness as an integral part of her call. She had been praying, let me share with you his pain. And she now recognized that this prayer had been answered. Jesus was letting her relive his agony. And because it was his, she was happy to take it upon herself. Hello, darkness, my old friend. 
And just as Mother Teresa cries out, how long, O Lord, will you stay away? The psalmist cries out his own questions, beginning in verse 10. Do you show your wonders to the dead? Do their spirits rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave, your faithfulness in destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? These verses shouted out in the darkness get no response, or at least no response that the psalmist recognizes and shares with us. But just because these questions are unanswered in the psalm, it does not mean they remain unanswered. Psalm 88 on its own is like that sad song you listen to on repeat over and over again in your pajamas with your only two friends, Ben and Jerry. But Psalm 88 is not on its own. Psalm 88 is part of a bigger book, part of a bigger story. And it is in that bigger story that we can find those answers. Verses 11 and 12 asks, Is your love declared in the grave, your faithfulness and destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? The answer on this side of the cross is an emphatic yes. Romans 8 says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Psalm 88 verse 14 says, Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? But then Deuteronomy answers, The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. I was and still am a big fan of the TV show The West Wing. And one of my favorite scenes was when one character was in crisis and he turns to his mentor and asks, why are you willing to help me? And his mentor tells a story that very closely parallels Jesus' story of the Good Samaritan. A man falls down a hole and can't get out. A doctor comes walking by, writes out a prescription and throws it in the hole. A priest comes by Man cries for help. The priest writes out a prayer, throws it in the hole. Finally, a friend comes by, and the man cries out for help, and the friend promptly turns and jumps into the hole. And the man says, what are you doing? Are you stupid? Now we're both down here. But then the friend replies, yeah, but I've been down here before, and I know the way out. We have a God who jumped in the hole with us, who came down to earth and lived among us. Jesus lived out Psalm 88 when he hung on the cross and cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We have a God who knows the way out of loneliness and despair, and he wants to show us. But he also wants us to jump back in and show others the way out. Earlier I mentioned that nine million people in the UK were struggling with often or always feeling alone. In response to this report and to other um, findings, they decided to come up with a new position, um, a minister of loneliness someone who will address this concern. Shouldn't that also be our calling as the church, ministers of loneliness? My period of isolation in high school was fortunately balanced out by my relationships at our church. I was part of a youth group and I had four really good friends there who countered my feelings of loneliness with, with, with feelings of acceptance and being cared for. And it wasn't just my friends, but a hodgepodge of adults That included Jim, our youth worker, friends of my parents, our choir director, and the deacon who let us eat the leftover communion bread, and many others who helped me feel like I was an integral part of that community. Many of you have had a similar experience here, but some of you have not. Sadly for some, the church has left you feeling lonely and isolated. We can do better to live out our role as ministers of loneliness. Oftentimes, it's hard to see the lonely, It's not like they're walking around waving, hey, I'm lonely, help me. But maybe we can start by reaching out to those around us that may be more susceptible to loneliness and isolation. Look at the students around you. What can you do to help them have the same experience that I did at my church growing up? Who are some of the older people in your neighborhoods that would appreciate a visit? Veteran parents, how can you be a source of encouragement to those overwhelmed parents who don't know how they managed to get here this morning with everyone wearing pants. Who are the people in your community that have been pushed aside and made to feel alone? How can you reach out with the kindness of Christ to those who have only heard words of judgment and hatred? 
and to those that are struggling with loneliness until a minister of loneliness comes and finds you, maybe follow the example of the psalmist and cry out to the God who saves. Pray for the strength and courage to ask for help. Maybe start with one of the prayer ministers at the end of the service. Pray that God would send help, that he would send someone to sit in the darkness with you. Or pray that God would jump into the hole with you and help you find your way out. Let's all pray together now.